So now what I want to show you is the major complication that can occur following a paracetamol overdose. And this can occur following both staggered overdose and an all-in-one go overdose. And this is what giving NAC is aimed to prevent. So I've been on the World Wide Web here, Google, and I've typed in hepatonecrosis. So this word, hepato means a liver, necrosis means death. So this means the death of the liver. And you can see that Google is actually trying to correct it to two separate words, hepatic necrosis. However, I do assure you that hepatonecrosis is a word. It, it, is used in medicine. You could say hepatic necrosis, they mean the same thing, uh, but using it all as one word is a done thing. And to try and show you what actually happens in this, I've also put in CT. So we've got some CT images here of what the liver actually looks like when hepatonecrosis is occurring. So this looks like a good image here. Now I'm not a radiologist, but the abnormality here is pretty glaringly obvious. So I can talk you through what we've got here. So this is a axial cross-section of someone's body at the level of the liver. And here we have the spine. So this is the back of the body. This is the front of the body. This is the right side and this is the left side. So here is the spine. Here's the spinal cord. And then this is the vertebral column. Then we've got the aorta here, so a massive artery, and CT, remember, is x-rays, so bones show up white on CT. So you might ask, well, why is a massive blood vessel showing up bright white? Well, the reason is that often when we do CT imaging, we inject the person who's having the scan done with a radio contrast agent first, so we give them a dye into their bloodstream, we inject it into a vein, it disseminates, we give it a few minutes to disseminate all over the body, so it goes into all the blood vessels of the body. And this dye makes the blood appear bright white on CT imaging, on x-rays as well, but also on the CTs. And this produces much better quality images. Everything in the abdomen in particular can look just grey if you do a non-contrast CT, which is a CT where you haven't injected the radio contrast into the blood. So it's far more common for CT scans to be contrast CTs than non-contrast CTs. Sometimes we can't do contrast CTs because if people have very bad renal function, we don't like giving the radio contrast agent because the radio contrast agent has to be excreted by the kidneys afterwards. Obviously, it doesn't just stay in the blood forever. Instead, it's excreted by the kidneys into the urine. And if people have very bad kidney function, you know, we get worried about how long the radio contrast agent is therefore going to stay in their bloodstream for because their kidneys are so bad at getting rid of waste products. And so they'll be bad at getting rid of the radio contrast agent as well. Also, there is the current medical position is that radio contrast is actually damaging to the kidneys, that it can be nephrotoxic in particular in people who already have pre-existing kidney disease, that it might actually damage the kidneys further. Now, that is a controversial point of view. It's becoming more controversial. Some people are now vehemently opposed to this and say it's not nephrotoxic. However, the current medical position is still that it is nephrotoxic and that we don't want to do contrast CTs, therefore, in people who have already very bad renal function, and we could make their renal function even worse by giving them this agent. In people with very healthy kidneys, we're not worried about it, because usually it doesn't cause a problem, and even if it does, the problem's probably going to be temporary, reversible, and not actually, they probably won't even notice it, it won't cause symptoms, because their renal function might just dip for a little while, but then it will go back up, and that small dip won't be noticeable, won't cause symptomatic problems. Whereas if you've already got extremely poor renal function, then we give you a dip in it further, then it might tip you into being quite unwell. So overall, um, we usually do contrast CTs rather than non-contrast CTs, and this is a contrast CT, which is the reason that the blood vessels show up bright white. These are blood vessels here as well with the contrast agent in. What else have we got here? So we've got the bottom ribs. So these are all ribs in white here. This is the stomach here with some air in it, which is the black stuff. And then this is the liver or what's left of the liver. Now, this sort of texture, this sort of light grey 
tissue here. This is sort of normal looking liver tissue. And then these patches of sort of a darker gray here, these are not normal tissue. This is where the normal tissue has died, has undergone hepatic necrosis and has lost its normal structure. The cells are all just dying and disintegrating and you're probably left with what is frankly mush in these positions. So that's what's really happening in hepatic necrosis. That's what it looks like on a CT image. Also, another massive abnormality that you've got on this CT is all of this sort of dark grey stuff here. So if you Google normal CT of the liver and compare this image to a normal one, firstly, obviously, you'll see that these bits aren't in the normal one, but also you'll see that this dark grey sort of thick layer here won't be present, and that's because it's not normal. So this is fluid that's accumulated in the peritoneal cavity. It's a peritoneal effusion, or more commonly we call the peritoneal effusion ascites. So this is the beginning of ascites forming here, and that's forming because the portal vein drains through the liver, and when the liver is massively diseased, the fluid flow through the portal system reduces, and everything sort of gets backed up, congested, and all of that fluid has to go somewhere, so it ends up sort of being pushed out into the peritoneal cavity, so you get a peritoneal effusion and ascites. So you've got the beginning of that here because of the liver pathology that is occurring here. So that then is hepatonecrosis. That is the ultimate complication of paracetamol overdoses, and this is what we can very effectively prevent by giving NAC. Now, before we move on and talk about NAC, let's just talk further about hepatonecrosis. What actually happens to individuals who are unfortunate enough to suffer hepatonecrosis? What are the outcomes of this? So really, there are three possible outcomes that can follow this. Outcome one is that the individual will die as a direct result of the hepatonecrosis. So let's discuss that further. So this disease process occurring inside the liver is going to make the individual extremely unwell. It's going to make them profoundly sick. And the reason is that this dying liver tissue is going to be releasing all sorts of things into the bloodstream, all sorts of chemicals and cytokines that are going to lead to the whole of the body responding and potentially in a very negative way. It can lead to what's known as a cytokine storm in the same way that a severe infection in the body can lead to a cytokine storm. So it can effectively make them septic in the same way that a severe infection would make an individual septic. So you might start to get organ systems failing, so the kidneys might start to fail because of the cytokine storm. The lungs might start to fail, you might get respiratory failure because of an ARDS type reaction in response to the cytokine storm. You might start to get brain failure, um, not a term that we use that often, but you know, the patient might become extremely confused, delirious from the cytokine storm. The cardiovascular system might start to collapse because all the blood vessels start to lose their vasomotor tone in response to the cytokines, so their blood pressure will collapse. Doctors will then flood them full of fluids to try and get their blood pressure back up. And then their kidneys won't be able to get rid of all that fluid, won't be able to cope with it, and therefore they'll just end up fluid overloaded, blown up like a balloon. Um, and then eventually all of these other organ systems failing will lead to further homeostatic derangements. And if everything gets bad enough, then eventually the heart will just give in and stop beating. It will go into arrest and death will follow very quickly. So hepatonecrosis can make individuals extremely ill, profoundly septic effectively, and some people will not survive that initial insult. So that's outcome one, death directly by the hepatonecrosis process. Outcome two is that the individual might actually survive the hepatonecrosis, but then they go on to die from secondary liver failure. So even though the individual has managed to survive the death of the liver, the liver hasn't managed to survive. The liver has died and not enough liver tissue is left for them to have a functional liver. So they then get liver failure. Now liver failure is fatal as well. It's just fatal much slower. So what does the liver do? It does all sorts of things. It filters the blood, for example, that's coming from the gastrointestinal tract. So after the gastrointestinal tract has absorbed things from the stuff that we've eaten, 
that those chemicals and nutrients go into the portal system and they then have to go through the liver first and the liver takes out loads of chemicals and changes them at, before they can then go into the systemic circulation. If you take away the liver function instead, all of that blood just gets dumped into the systemic circulation with all of the chemicals from the GI tract without any of them having been modified and this causes major changes. It is problematic you know loads of chemicals end up in the systemic circulation that weren't supposed to be there they were supposed to be filtered out by the liver and altered and made safe before they were thrown into the systemic circulation so your blood gradually gets poisoned by these chemicals that aren't being removed by the liver in addition our body produces those waste products that the liver has to metabolize break down change into other things that can then be either excreted by the kidneys or be excreted directly by the liver into the bile duct so again that doesn't happen so overall you get massive chemical derangements in the blood following liver failure and this will eventually build up to levels that it proves fatal now of course the famous ones are that bilirubin doesn't get broken down, the waste product from red blood cells, and bilirubin builds up in the blood. And the reason it's famous is because it then deposits into the skin and turns you yellow, because it itself is yellow. So the skin goes yellow and the eyes go yellow, and that's a phenomenon called jaundice. So people become yellow as liver failure progresses. Um, also, the chemicals usually result in the brain no longer being able to function, so you go delirious. That's called hepatic encephalopathy. And eventually, again, the levels of these chemicals will build up high enough that you'll get multi-organ failure and eventually cardiac arrest. So that is outcome two, that you can have death from secondary liver failure from the hepatonecrosis. And of course, outcome two can be treated if the individual has a liver transplant, if that's available, then they'll have a functional liver again. And if they survive the operation, they'll have a functional liver and then they won't die of liver failure. So outcome two can be treated if a liver transplant is available, but often, you know, liver transplants are in scarce supply. Now, outcome three is the brighter one. Outcome three, some people will actually survive hepatonecrosis and not develop liver failure. Some people, this can happen like this, and yet the liver manages to recover and they survive the actual hepatonecrosis and then they don't get liver failure. Their livers recover amazingly and they have a functional liver afterwards and then they go on and live. So it's not a death sentence hepatonecrosis. However, those are the minority that manage to recover. The majority will be in either outcome one where they die directly from the cytokine storm from the hepatonecrosis or outcome two where they die from secondary liver failure.